He said he never called. They wouldn't listen to him. Do you think he will listen to you? Uh, I'm when you say, say just talk, people, when did you talk to him? Uh, like? Two hours ago. Okay. He called me. I didn't okay. call him. And our country has been poisoned, okay? They're all threats to our nation. She would have no idea what we're talking about. Do you think 2024 could be one of those years that we look back and say they lost so. the African-American vote? The real threat isn't global warming. The real threat is nuclear warming. Great. That's not the question I'm asking, if I may. Just let's go in the middle of the ocean and talk. You have to set your phone aside. If I were president, that war would have never happened. Who were really the power players? Who were the manipulators? Who were the ones that would threaten them behind closed doors? <laughs> no, I don't want to put you in trouble. More beautiful than any word I know, Tara. If I buy this in U.S. and it's made in U.S., it's $2,400. Well, let me explain. Can you send me that chart? Look at that. I, I spent some time with Bill. He loved having you that night. You're like a psychiatrist for a lot of people. Because this stuff is very good. Now let's end the show right now. <laughs> <laughs>So before you watch this interview, I want to share a couple thoughts with you. For a guy like me, I used to come up in business. I never liked politics, never paid attention to it. I could care less. My parents got a divorce. I don't want to deal with it. I hate politics. Then I realized it matters to pay attention to politics. I'm starting to pay a lot of money. And I'm like, wait a minute, what is this all about? If you consider yourself the leader of your household, never has there been a more important time than today to pay attention to politics. By the way, if you love Trump and you're already committed to voting for him, you're going to love this interview because there's a lot of things he's never talked about before. If you hate Trump, and nothing can change your mind. You're also going to love this interview. But if you're part of the independent, undecided voter that's sitting there saying, I really want to make up my mind of who I'm voting for, I address three issues. Personal life. I asked him a question at the end about personal that played a clip for him. You'll get to decide if you got emotional or not. You'll see body language for yourself and say... Now, I've never seen this side before of him, right? I asked him questions about business. I asked him a question about when he became president. You went into the White House first. Who were the power players? Who, who was the most? Was, was it director of CIA? Was it Big Pharma? Was it military? Who was it? I never thought the answer he was going to give me and what name he gave to some of the people. I've never heard him say that before. He reacted to a few videos about Barack Obama. I showed him a couple charts he had never seen before. But all I will tell you is... You're going to see things that's never been discussed with them before for the first time ever in this interview. So with that being said, again, if you consider yourself the leader of your household where your voice matters, your vote matters, I would pay attention to every single minute of this interview with the one and only President Donald J. Trump. Did you ever think you were making it? I feel I'm so close I can take sweet victory I know this life meant for me yeah. Why would you bet on Goliath when we got bet David? Value came in, giving values contagious. This world of entrepreneurs, we get no value to haters How they run, homie, look what I become I'm the, I'm the one So we have a special guest in the house today for the podcast. We've been waiting to do this for a long time. However, whether you love him or hate him, there's one thing you have to know. In my opinion, he is the only trifecta we've ever had in the history of America. Let me tell you why I call him a trifecta. We've only had one person who's won in business and became the king of New York, became a billionaire. That's one. Two, he won in media, number one show, uh, Apprentice, 15 years in a row. Three, he becomes a president. So you got he won in business, he won in media, he won in politics. Again, there's never been a person who's done that. Like I said, whether you love him or hate him, you have to respect him. Mr. President, it's great to have you. That was you a nice introduction. That was, yes. Thank you very much. You I are a one of one. Yeah, let's end the show right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I want to get right into it. I got a lot of questions I want to ask you. Some of it's uh, personal, some of it's business, some of yeah. it's politics. But something happened last week. Barack Obama, he's at this event, he's speaking. Right. And he's given this message about your economy, how great the economy was. And then at the end of it, he says, you know, you didn't build that economy. I built this. I kind of want to get your reaction on this uh, okay. talk that he's given. Rob, if you can put that up. And the reason some people think, well, I don't know, I remember that economy when he first came in being pretty good. Yeah, it was pretty good because it was my economy. <laughs> we had had 75 straight months of job growth that I handed over to him. It wasn't something he did. I had spent eight years cleaning up the mess that the Republicans had left me the last time. So just in case everybody has a hazy memory, <laughs> that, 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 he, didn't, he didn't do nothing except those big tax cuts. 
So how do you feel about this when you, when you see him saying this last week? I think he's angry. He pretends not to be, but I think he's an angry guy. He's a nasty guy. Uh, uh, he's got a little bit of an edge, and you know, he's, he's angry about a lot of things. Uh, you look at what happened with Biden, mm -hmm. and you look at what he did with Biden. He really hurt Biden because uh, I'm not sure he wouldn't have imploded anyway. We had the debate, and he was down quite a bit, and they walked out, and they just took it away from him. I mean, if you think about it, they stole the election from a sitting president. That's, you know, I, I always say coup, but the word coup, I don't think it's accurate enough. They just walked in and took it away from him. That That is a legendary thing. What He didn't want to give up. He's angry now. Uh, they're all angry, the Democrats, if you think. She's angry. They're, they're both angry. But, uh, no, I watched that last week, and I think he spoke down to black men. I thought it was terrible the way he spoke to them. Uh, but uh, you, you think know. it's effective? You think he still carries the same stick as the, he did, you know, maybe eight years ago or twelve years ago? No, I don't think it is. No, I don't think he does. I think people have gotten smart, and uh, no, I don't believe he does at all. He's, uh, I hadn't seen him. He's changed a lot. Visually, he's changed. I like to say visually as opposed to from the look standpoint, because of course looks don't matter anymore in politics. You know, you what? say. Looks don't matter. It doesn't make any difference, right? Because we want to be politically correct, but they do matter. But he's he's changed. His look has changed actually quite a bit. I haven't seen him in a long time. And I, by the way, Rob, I think that's even four years uh, ago. I think it's even more than yeah, it is yeah. Well, uh, today. no, but the the statement he just made was a couple of days ago, and that yeah, it was a couple of days ago. Looks, and, uh, and it's similar to the statement he made back in 2012 when he told business owners, "You didn't build that." Remember yeah, when he yeah. said that? I don't know if you remember that whole comment. I think yeah. this is the speech, Rob. If you want to play this, if you got a business. That, you didn't build that. Somebody else made that happen. So this becomes a pattern, a pattern of... Communism. It, it, you see a pattern of communism well, there? No, I mean, that's basically the view. You know, we didn't do anything. Right. Government did it. Somebody did it, but anybody but us. Do you think this works with the undecided voter? Do you think the undecided voter that's sitting... Our audience, they're entrepreneurs, they're small business owners... They're family, they have kids, they want to win, they got dreams, they want to do something. Do you think a message like that from him lands on the business owner, on the undecided voter, on the person that says, you know what, I think he's right, I'm going to go vote for him? Do yeah. you think it works? I, I think you don't have that many undecided voters, I think, by now. You have very strong Trump voters. I don't think you have strong, you have strong Democrat voters, but I don't think you have strong Kamala voters. What's mm. to vote for? I mean, take a look. She can't do an interview. She hasn't. Has she been in here to do an interview? No, not yet. I don't no. think you'll see her. You know, I have a. She's claiming she's going to go on Rogan. Well, that'll be interesting. So am I. I heard. Uh, but I think I am. I don't know. I think so. But uh, it'll be interesting. It'll be interesting to see what happens today with Brett Bear. You know, Brett's two people. He can be very nice or he can be uh, himself. He was tough on you. If he's tough on her the way oh, he, was he was tough always, on you, no. he was very tough on he you. He was with always the, no, he was always nasty to me and Right. Uh, I don't think he'll be tough on her. I don't think he'll be. Fox is a very disappointing thing. During the days, Fox is just terrible. Terrible. And uh but, I, I want to show something with this. When, when you look at this whole Barack Obama thing, I think the one thing they don't show, you were talking yesterday. Uh, I think it was the Bloomberg event, which, by the way, I loved. Yeah. I, I loved the way you handled all well, the terrorist conversation. I, I, that was a great event. I got event. sort of, uh, I got hoodwinked to, to go on that. You know, I was supposed to make a speech in front of the Chicago Economic Club, which is a big deal, you know, which is a very prestigious place, beautiful. Everything was beautiful. And all of a sudden, I understand I'm being interviewed by this gentleman. And he's got a reputation for, for being about, oh, I'd love to see him do uh, Kamala. We should, he should do Kamala. That would be beautiful. But he's a tough cookie, and he he's the chairman of uh, Bloomberg. He's a big mm -hmm, guy. So mm -hmm. all of a sudden, I'm being interviewed. And I wasn't happy about it because I found out that he is, you know, his reputation precedes him. And uh, But I decided to do it. You, you know, you have a choice. Walk out and don't do it and have a scandal. Or go in and do it and hopefully win. Or you go in and do it and you get killed, which is probably the worst. But... Uh, it was a great, it was a great interview actually. And he was nasty, but he wasn't overly nasty to me. I mean, other people thought he was, I thought nastier was David Muir when he kept interrupting me during the debate and saying false things. Like when I said crime is way up and he said, no, no crime is down. I said, you're wrong about that. Crime is up. And then two days later it came out that crime is That's up. Right. 
Uh, I mean, to me, that was much nastier than uh, this gentleman. But but it was it was really a study of business. It was a detailed study of business. You're and talking about with the Bloomberg one? With the Bloomberg. Right. And people loved it. I agree. The tariff one. And the one thing I wanted to show is the following. So you know how you talked about Jerome Powell, what an easy job. You come once yeah. a month and you say, we're going to increase the rates. Greatest I job think, there I is. I think this is the one thing they don't talk about. So Barack Obama got elected November 4th. Okay. Quantitative easing started November 26th. Right. And it stayed for eight years until you got elected. Right. So if you look at that low, pretty much 0% interest rate. Right. And then you get elected, right? If you go to January 2016, Rob, for the audience to see that. And then from there, one by one by one, rates are going up, going up, going up, going up, going up. And then Biden comes in, goes back down to zero to try to save the economy. And then, you know, the rest is obviously yeah, history. Right, right. But do you think the average person knows, like, the impact of going to 0%? How how much does that positively help the oh, impact it's, when Fed lowers the rates to half a point? Yeah, it has a huge impact. The the power of the Fed is, I think, pretty strong. Some people disagree with it. They think it, you know, it's overridden mm -hmm. by the interest rate climate. But I think the power of the Fed is very strong. It's an interesting graph, actually. Yeah, this just shows that the rates didn't help you. You know, when he says it was... Well, it, they it, didn't use them to help me. Right. Uh, and Powell, uh, I gave him a hard time because he was raising them. And uh, I was never a big fan of his. He was late and he was early. He was too early and too late, you know. But um, but I had the greatest economy in history. We had the greatest economy in the history of our country. Despite that, you know, this is another thing I can say. Despite the fact that they weren't very high, but they were, you know, reasonably high. And uh, despite the rates not being at zero, uh, I had a pretty good, uh, I had a great, we had a great run. It, it, following up on the Barack Obama question, when I think about the 2024 election, I saw some numbers that came out, which I thought was fascinating. Right. Rob, if you can pull this up from CNN. So this is CNN reporting on this just two days ago. Ah. Okay, Barack Obama, when it comes down to black men ages 18 to 44, he was up 81 points in November of 2012. Clinton, Hillary was up 63 when she went against you. Yeah. Biden was up 53. Kamala who is apparently black, she's up 41. And what do you, you mean by apparently? I mean, that's what they're telling us. We're oh, supposed to believe she's black. No, and, you know, it's I'm, I'm, much better that, no, no. See, I would never say a thing like that. But you say, don't explain to what you mean. <laughs> no, I don't want to put you in trouble. Yeah, apparently. No, no. Well, I, no, mean, I was, no, was going to throw it onto your shoulders, apparently. Well, no, you know, you, you could explain it because I understand. I'm very comfortable explaining it because yeah. overnight, you know, she's doing a show. She's supposed to be Indian. And then all of a sudden now it's black, but it's not landing with the average American. So if you look and at this- And do you think black men, that's why she's not doing well? Well, watch this. Some here. people say that. In 2016, you had 13% right. of male black voters, 18 right. to 44. Right. In 2020, you had 18%. In 2024, you're at 26%. It's doubled yeah. in eight years. The question I'm asking you is the following. Back in 1960, 64% right. of African Americans would vote Democrat. Right. The other was pretty much conservative. African Americans mm -hmm. have historically been very conservative. Okay. Barry Goldwater, the issue happens, 1964. Right. It goes from 64% yeah. Democrat to 92%. And it's been between 85 to 92% since 1964, right? You've come in and you've shaken things up. Do you think 2024 is going to be one of those moments where African-American men, they're like, listen, I'm sick and tired of Democrats feeling like they own me. I think I'm going to, to go to the other side. Do you, think, do you think 2024 could be one of those years that we look back and say they lost so. the African-American vote? They really lost it for a while, the Republicans. I mean, it went, and it started, I guess, with Barry Goldwood, if you look at the charts. But uh, I did criminal justice reform. That's a big thing. They've been trying to get it. You know, I saw a guy named Van Jones. He's a... Not any, I don't think anybody knows who he is. He's a commentator for CNN. And he came to see me in the White House, and he was crying. I remember that. He was crying because he, I just, I have, I bring these things up because it's a lack of, I don't know, there's something about loyalty. You help somebody with something. Uh, he came in with a uh, fairly large group of people, mm -hmm. uh, mostly black people, and he was devastated because criminal justice reform wasn't going to happen. Uh, Obama didn't do it and uh, didn't even come close. Bush didn't try. Nobody nobody was going to do it. And I'm the only one that could have done it. 
And he was with a group of people that was, uh, they were begging to do it. They were five votes short. And they were had to be conservative votes because there was nobody else left, right? And I guess you needed the 61 or 60-something, 60 mm -hmm. maybe 66, but 61 is a hard vote. And he made a plea to me, Van Jones, total sleazebag. He made a plea to me to help him and help this group of people. And they explained how for years they've been trying to get it, and they've been unable to get it. And I said, uh, well, let's take a look at it. And um, I studied it for a little while and uh, spoke to them. And I said, you know what? I'm going to help you. It's going to help the black people in particular. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to get it for you guys. And I called up five very conservative senators. And I'll never forget one of the senators who was in charge of it. He was literally leading the charge against it. And I mean... His whole career was this. He was going to stop criminal justice reform. Not because he was, uh, you know, anti-black, just he didn't like it. He didn't want it. And he was in the papers every day. He's fighting and fighting it, winning very easily. And I helped him get elected. Without me, he wouldn't have gotten elected. I'll never forget it. I called him up. Now, he's in the heat of passion. He is fighting this all the way. Not something he would ever give up. You couldn't, you know, there's some mm -hmm, things you can't. Mm -hmm. I call him up. He gets on the phone. I didn't say a word. I said, hello. And he goes, uh, I'm giving it to you. I said, what are you giving me? I'm giving you criminal justice reform. That's why you're calling, right? I said, it is why I'm calling. He said, you got me elected. I disagree with you, but I'm giving it to you just like that. I said, that's one of the coolest things I've ever heard because I also have the opposite where I got a lot of people elected. You know, when I endorse somebody in history, and I don't want to brag, but in history, you can get another chart on that one. I mean, I'm like 289 and, and almost nothing for endorsements. And he said, you got me elected. I wouldn't even be here if it wasn't for you. And I did, but I got a lot of people elected and some of them forget. And I said, that's the coolest thing. I said, thank you. I said, do you mind if I call a couple of the... Nope, you do whatever you want. Now, this is a guy who was the leader of the fight. I didn't even ask. He knew what I was calling for because he knew mm -hmm. that I was going to help Van Jones, this Van Jones guy. I was going to help him. And you'll understand why I'm being nasty to him now because what happened later is disgraceful. So... Uh, I said, thank you very much, Senator. I'm so happy that I did help you. I think I think loyalty is a great thing. And that was the answer. I had his vote. I then called four other guys, uh, all of whom were against it. And I said, I'd love to have. And, they, you know, uh, they don't do it for a lot of presidents, but they do it for me. And I got them five votes that they needed, and criminal justice reform passed. Right? Then... And I was happy for them. I was happy for everybody. Everybody was happy. They couldn't believe they got it done. And it was something that really uh, the black population wanted far more than anybody else. I've never even heard it mentioned with other people. It was mostly the black population. And they've been fighting it for like, what, you'd say 40, 50 years, right? 64. So we Yeah, got 40, it 50 done. years, yeah. Yeah. So I got it done. I got something done. I got a lot of things done that nobody else could have gotten done. So what happens is... Uh, Van Jones and all, they have. They called for a news conference that night. The vote was taken. They got it done. And I said to my wife, come on over here. This is beautiful. This is a beautiful thing to watch. Watch this. Uh, this uh, gentleman was in my office a number of weeks ago, and he needed votes, and I got it done. It'll be nice to watch somebody really say something nice about mm -hmm. your husband. I said that to Melania, and uh, I said, watch this. And they got up and they spoke. But Van Jones got up. And it was a little, I get, I don't get too embarrassed. You know, he got up, he, he thanked this one, he thanked that one, he thanked this one, this one, that one, that one. The only one he didn't thank was Donald Trump. And I look at that sleaze bag now and I say, uh, he's got bad way, bad way. 
I, I looked at him. Then I saw him last night, and he was on CNN, which is dying, by the way, in the ratings, because they have people like him on. And I watched him last night say how he hopes I'll be defeated. And uh, we should defeat him. We have to fight him. He shouldn't be allowed to be. And I said, you know, uh, normally I'd say I wish I had that vote back, but I did the right thing. But why, do I, why do I think he praised you? Why do I think he got emotional crying, no, giving no. you credit about well, what he what you did? I don't know. I don't know. All I can tell you is he was crying in my office. That's probably what you heard. Before he got it, he was crying. He was literally, they went over to him with handkerchiefs. He was crying. Tears were pouring down his eyes before. But after he wasn't crying, not that I know, but... So he didn't mention me the night mm. of the news conference. He was leading the news conference. And I don't need it. I get mentioned plenty of times, et cetera, et cetera. But I watched last night. It's a good place to say this, actually. It's better than writing out a truth, whatever. But I watched last night, and I watched him talk about how I must be defeated. You know, I'm a bad guy or something. And Van Jones is saying this. Yeah, yeah. He said it last night. I saw him last night. I... I don't watch CNN. Honestly, I don't watch it. But I happen to be, you know, I, I'm passing it and I see him on and I watched him talking about, essentially negative about me. You know, what difference mm -hmm. does it make? Nobody mm -hmm. cares what they do. They have, uh, they've been fighting me for years and, you know, I became president. I did much better the second time than I did the first and now I'm doing it the third time and uh, if the election's not rigged, uh, we're going to win. If it is rigged, I guess that's a different story but we'll find out pretty soon. But, uh, but I watched this guy last night against me, even if he was a little against me, but he wasn't. He was like, you know, we have to defeat Trump. We have to defeat him. And I've watched him a little bit over the years. And every time I watch him, I say, what a, what a sleazebag he is, you know, what a bad guy. But I did it for black people. I did it for, it was, it was purely the only people that told me about criminal justice reform were uh, African-Americans, that's all. And I did it for them. I also did historically black colleges and universities, and uh, I got them financing. I would see uh, the heads of colleges come down after two years. They would come to Washington, like 45, 50 people, a group. They'd always come in, a big group. And I got to know them a little bit because they had to come through my office to get funding. And after the second time, I said to them, why do you keep coming down here for funding? Don't they give you? He said, no, they make, they make us feel like beggars. That was the term. Mm. And a couple of them I got really frustrated. Some of them I still see a little bit. And I said, uh, what does that mean? He said, every year we come down for funding for the black colleges and universities. And, and they play a great role, a very important role, in my opinion. So I said, so you mean every year you come down? We do. We get our... That we come down together and we go and see senators and congressmen and we try seeing a president. But I got to know him and I said, you know, this is no way to live where you come down. And I ended up getting them more money than they even wanted. And I got it done and I got it long term. And I said, fellas, I just got this done for you. And I want to tell you a little secret. I'm unhappy about it. They said, why? I said, because I'll probably never see you again. Mm you'll never come down to Washington to see me. And and I meant it actually in a friendly way because I got used to seeing them. They were always coming down looking for money. I took care of their needs long term, more money than they wanted. I said, you're going to need more money than that. And uh, I got it for them. And uh, I think that's why black men really like me. And I think black women do too. But they have a woman who is black Although you would say she's Indian, but uh, she is black. But she really, a lot of people didn't know, which mm -hmm. is true. But I learned about it just a couple months ago. I mean, you know, the fact that, that she's, she's black, black. Yeah. or that she's Indian. The fact that she's black. <laughs> I thought she was Indian until a couple yeah, months no. ago. Things change. I no, mean, a you lot know, of people. Well, because if you follow baseball, Sammy right. Sosa kind of, you know, you, you, right. you sometimes have to respect people. They Sammy. change. Right. So Sammy's I thought maybe she was doing a Sammy Sosa the other way. Yeah, Sammy's changed. Right. People change. If you remember Sammy Sosa. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. he could hit the ball. He right? could hit the ball 66 could, home runs. Seriously, yes. he was. But I want to show you this. And by the way, I, the only reason I want to show you this is because I think Van Jones is scared of giving you credit. This is what Van Jones said after what you did. 
And it was the most uncomfortable moment on CNN because he had to thank you. If, if you can play this clip, Rob, I think this is the clip. Go for it. Do you think this is? By the way, one of your partners in working on this, this was Jared Kushner. Jared Kushner. Who's, who's this is how many years ago? This is the date on 29. this five years ago, December 18th, 2018. Okay, play the clip. So you just got that. That's pretty yeah, cool. Yeah, so this is six wow. years ago. If you can play this clip. Father went to prison and who, who fought <laughs> on this as hard as that. This is history. This is history. Right now, you're witnessing history on the floor of the U.S. Senate. Mr. Perdue, for, it is Mr. a Christmas Perdue. miracle underway Hi. where, for the first time in a generation, Republicans and Democrats mm -hmm. are arm in arm tonight saying, we are sending Mr. too many people to prison. Mr. They're coming out bitter and not better. We want to make a tremendous difference. I want to mm -hmm. say uh, Hakeem Jeffries uh, on the left, Jared Kushner, and Donald Trump on the right have brought together a coalition like I've never seen. He gave He's you got credit. Literally, right. uh, the National yeah. Association of Manufacturers, Fox News, I never said and Sean Yeah, I'm glad you're seeing it because to me, you see, when I think about him, obviously, you know, it's history. He was close right. to Obama, communist, all that stuff. He had to kind of drop. But at the same time, they don't want him saying something like this. No. I want well, to give Hakeem Jeffries, yeah. Jarrett, and you to yeah. give that credit. It, yeah. This is the part where even Dems are sitting there saying, how the hell do we argue against the fact that a Republican president that we're not supposed to like did this, cut him off. Just give him 30 seconds, 40 seconds. Let's go to the next topic to bash him again. But it was kind of great to see Van Jones saying this about you. It was, but again, uh, right after that, he it was over. He has to go back. So he, he has to go he back, back, back and say things and a about real, you. A real man would not have done that. And, and <laughs> I'm glad I saw that. But it really doesn't mean anything because he said it, and then after that, he, uh, he, he took it back. I want to show you something, and this kind of goes maybe to the next point. So yesterday, a new Gallup poll came out. Okay, if you look at this Gallup poll, this is literally from yesterday. Americans trust in mass media from 72 to 2024. It officially hit the lowest in the history. We're talking ever. Not, not uh, uh, one of the lowest. This is the lowest ever in the history of America. Americans don't trust mass media anymore. And even recently, I don't know if you saw the numbers that came out two weeks ago. I'm sure you follow some of this stuff. Every one of the guys at CNN, MSNBC, they're all getting a lower salary when they're renewing their That's contract. Right. They're not getting they paid the kind of that. money they were making. Yeah. And, and by the way, you may not like me saying this to you, but I think I, I, I kind of want to see your reaction to this. I know a lot of people will say, well, you know, he has, uh, 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 you know, XYZ amount of felonies charged, 91, 53 were dismissed, 32 is this, and... 12 are the ones that are remaining. I think the only one that Letitia James, uh, Jack Smith, and maybe even uh, Fanny, if they wanted to, you know, claim that you you did commit a crime is you kind of, you kind of did kill mainstream media, if you think about I it. I did. And that's, that's, that could be a crime no, for those I, guys. I'm that, very proud of it. And too. I want to show you this clip because this is the first time ever the phrase fake news was ever used. And from this moment on is when the decline started. Rob, if you can go in and play this clip. Since you're attacking us, can you give us a question? Go since ahead. you're no, Mr. President-elect, go ahead. Mr. President-elect, since you are attacking no, our news not organization, you. Not can you. you give us a chance? Your organization you're, you are attacking terrible. our news organization. Your organization. Can you give us up. a chance Let's to go. ask a question, sir? Go ahead, sir. Can Quiet. you state, can, Quiet. Mr. President-elect? Go ahead. Can you state categorically? She's asking a question. Don't Mr. be rude. Mr. President-elect, can you give us a question? Don't be you're rude. You're attacking us. Can you give us a question? Don't be rude. Can you no, give us a question? Can I'm you, not going to give you a can question. You can you state categorically? You are fake news. Sir, go ahead. can you state categorically that nobody... No, Mr. President-elect, that's not go appropriate. Ahead. So, if you can... But isn't there. that disgusting? Think of it. And that would never happen to a Democrat. But isn't that disgusting? He's a, he's a lowlife, uh, the guy, and as you know. but uh, And he has his own show. He gets no ratings at all. Nobody on CNN gets ratings. Uh, but isn't that a disgusting... You know, I'm just watching that, and... Isn't it a shame that people can behave that way against the president, you know? And, uh, yeah, I think I got, uh, I think I'm responsible for those numbers up there where they went down. I'm, and frankly, I'm proud of it because they're, I also am responsible for the term fake news. And that's a great term, but it's not strong enough. I think it's corrupt news is a better term, but it doesn't play as well. But they're corrupt people and disgusting people but he is, uh, he, well, he, he wasn't as bad as some. I mean, in a certain way, he was louder, but he wasn't as smart as some. I mean, some are much smarter. He's not as smart. Did one. you think you were going to say fake news, or was it just kind of came out and then it stuck? You're like, this is going to stick. Was it intentional? I, I was don't it... know if that's the first time I've used it. 
But I do get credit for having, you know, having been an originator of the term. I mean, you know, a lot of times I come up with, I have a very fertile mind. I come up with very good names for people. You're very creative. Pocahontas. Yes. Lots of good names. But, but, you know, I don't know if that's the first time, but I thought of that term often. And more so uh, as I was running. You know, I, I actually used to get great press when I was an entrepreneur. I would get very glamorous press, very beautiful press. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, went to, I went the exact opposite. And I was amazed. And I, I really... I really learned how corrupt it was. I didn't think of it as that corrupt because, you know, I'd do something and they give me mm -hmm. credit. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, no, I, I've, uh, I had a very different life, actually, when you think about it. But then I run for president. Uh, so 92% of the people that run for president, presidents, 92% were politicians and 8% were generals. So I wasn't a politician. I wasn't a general. So I was the only one that wasn't in that group. No, there were no admirals. Uh, they were all either politicians or they were sort of an interesting point. Most people don't know that. Some people said that's interesting. Other that makes people sense say because that's even funny. Reagan would be a politician because he was a two-term governor. Well, he was a politician. Right, he was a politician. Yeah, he was a, he yes. was a governor. Uh, there were some that were businessmen, but they were then ran for the Senate or they were in mm -hmm. Congress and mm -hmm. you know they went from there to mm -hmm. the presidency. But... Um, nobody ever went right to the presidency. You know, I would never rent for office. All of a sudden, I'm president. And I, I really learned about the press early in the hard way because I went from one extreme to the other. I got great press. And then all of a sudden, I was treated like by a moron like that. And I, I really, I, I fought them very hard. They're very dishonest. They're very corrupt. Not all of them, but a big percentage of them. I would say... Um, in the 80s, that's a lot. That's a lot. Big percentage. They're very corrupt. Very corrupt. Have they I always watch, been? Has it always been the case? You've been around main, You've been around, you know, yeah. media, TV. I, I don't your think it's ever life. been like this. Yeah, I've been around it for a long time. I don't think it's ever been like when this. When do you think it? You know, flipped? when I started off, Patrick, I used to have a story written about me, and without fail, somebody would call after the story was mm -hmm. written but not published, and they were called fact checkers. Hello, sir. We're calling about a story that we wrote about you. Is it true that you own this? And is it true that you did this? And uh, that you spent uh, X dollars? Could we check that right. number? Ba, ba, ba. And it would go on for a while to a point where you'd get somebody else to just do it. But they, without fail, I'd have, if there were any details in a story, not always, but if there were any details, always. And they would call fact checkers. Hello, sir. My name's uh, Jim Smith. I'm a fact checker for the New York Times. And they check the facts of a story. And I think they at least at least were trying to be real. I haven't had a fact checker call me in 30 years. You know, they don't call anymore. Do you they think that's because the of the time. Fairness Doctrine Act of 1987? Because prior yeah. to that, the media platforms had to actually give <clears throat> both sides of the story. And then once that was dropped, they, they lost the accountability. They could say whatever they want to say. And it was kind of free for all. Let me go after them. But for you, when you became a president, you know, if someone's running for office, you have to sit there and think about issues. Here's what I'm running on. Wall, border, you know, economy, X, Y, Z. Great. Obama, I'm going to go after health care. Yeah. Jimmy Carter, I'm going to go human rights. You pick and choose what you're running for. But there's also an element of who are going to be my allies, who are going to be my, my enemies. Did you sit there and say, the enemy of the people is media. I'm going to go after them. Or did you say, no, this happened accidentally? Was this intentional or was it accidental? I think it's just long term happened. It morphed into it. Got I don't it. think they said. But, I'm talking but specifically I can tell for you, you though. Yeah. Now, for me, I, look, I'm the worst case because there's nobody been abused like I have. And I don't think, although I guess probably some, but for a shorter period of time. There's nobody for over such a long... Who would you put? You even thought time. about it. Who, who, do, who do you think? For I'd, short, I'd have to would... think short-term people have been abused. Yeah. Worse, worse over than... one deal and they're gone or, oh, okay. or something. I got it. Got but it. I've, been, you know, I've been doing this for a long time. Right. And I've abused them also. So, you know, I do that. But did you say, did you target them and say, I'm going to go attack media and I'm going to go after them? Is that part of strategy that you had? Or no, that was just, no. if you come after me, I'm going to come you know, after you. No, I think it's a natural instinct with me. You know, like it. it would be for right. you and right. other people that know how to win a little bit. Sure. Um, no, but, but I, I really saw it in politics. I would tell them something and they would write the opposite. Mm-hmm. 
I said, what's that all about? I called up. The Washington Post was treating me very bad. New York Times is probably the worst, but the, the two of them are really bad. And I know how to deal with the press. I'm a professional. I'm a smart guy, and I know. So I said, watch. I'm going to call the press in, Washington Post, I during my first or second uh, year. Mm -hmm. And I said, I'm going to call the Washington Post. I'm not going to joke. I'm not going to be cute. I'm not going to be a wise guy. I'm going to just call him in, and I want to talk. And I'm going to explain what a great job I've done on different things, like the economy. I had a great economy. Mm -hmm. All the And I called him in. I was very nice. I didn't say, like I didn't say, hey, how's it going? Everything was really professional. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The numbers were fantastic. Everything was perfect. And I treated them with great respect, shook their hand, and it was over. And the next day they wrote a horrible story. You know, it was, and I said, there's no way around it. And usually it's the liberal side, and I don't understand it really. Why wouldn't they want to have a strong border? I don't understand them because, you know, usually like in business, you'll understand why somebody mm -hmm. wants something. Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't they want to have a strong border? Why do they want to have men playing in women's sports? I watched the Olympics and two people transitioned into womanhood. Mm -hmm. Two people. They went from man to woman and they were into boxing. And they beat the hell out of everyone. They won the gold medal. But weightlifting, records that held for 18 years, a quarter of an ounce on each side. You've seen me do it probably because it's so cool. I mean, weightlifting is so easy to, you know, it's so descriptive, right? How can you be better than that? Like golf is a little bit harder because you have to sink putts. That's different. Women can putt, but they can't lift, you know, 450 pounds over their head. And the weightlifting record that stood for 18, 19 years gets broken by 100 pounds. You know, I mean, they put like a little, they take right. this, they take this top of this pen. See that pen? That thing weighs like an eighth of an ounce. And they put one over here and one over. They couldn't do it for 18 years. And a guy comes along. It's crazy. I mean, the and border could make sense, though. If you were I, to say, like, why would they want the border to be why open? Why do they there want an open border? an argument to be made there. Well, why do they want an open border with no check-in? In other words, there's nobody vetted, nobody right. checked. And as you heard two weeks ago, the Border Patrol put out the numbers. They weren't supposed to, but they did because they had to. Because they had to inherently, you know, they endorsed me. I saw that. Powerful. They endorsed me. 100% unanimous. Right. Like a massive, a full, they said he's the greatest in the history of, I had the best border in the history of the country. I had the best economy in the history of the country. But you take a look at some of these stats. So yesterday, a, a young woman's playing volleyball. You saw that chart? And he got hit by a, a hard shot by a man, a man who transitioned. There's been many of those. If there was a new one yesterday, she got hit in the head. So she, she didn't know where she was. Right. You know? She said, "I've never seen a ball travel at that speed before." But, but here's why: Why do they want that? I don't understand that. You, usually, you understand like somebody wants something. Mm -hmm. You try and figure it mm -hmm. out, and you could go through a lot of things. You know, why do they want uh, transgender? Why do they want to take somebody's child, a boy? And make the boy into a girl and not tell the parents. I mean, they do this. And at first I said, no, no, but that's just an exaggeration. No, it's not. It's really not. State of California. Why do they want to? Yeah. Well, look at, look at California. Gavin Newsom, who's one of the worst governors, but he's got a good line of stuff. And he'll, he'll tell everyone how well he's done. But it's the first time they've ever lost more people than they gained. You know, they look, look they have such an advantage. The beautiful ocean. The beautiful weather, the, everything is beautiful. And they run it so badly with all of the problems. They run it so, he's a crummy governor, but but why why is it so yesterday? And who would sign the bill to even present it to him? He signed a bill that you're not even allowed to ask for voter ID. In other words, it's not like you can't have voter ID. That's terrible because everybody should have voter ID. Or, you have ID for everything. The Democrats had big ID. You know, when they had their convention, a friend of mine couldn't get in. He said he doesn't have the proper credentials. They want voter ID. Mm -hmm. They they had a strong ID. They had an ID that you had to wear, like a prisoner wears, you know, with a number. Mm -hmm. It was like this big card with a picture and everything over their tie. So they have it for the Democrat National Convention, right? But they don't want to have it for the vote. But, but Gavin Newsom signed a thing that was incredible. 
He signed a bill that if you ask somebody for identification having to do with voting, I think you've committed a crime, okay? Now, there's only one reason that that happens, because they want to cheat. There's no other reason. There's no conceivable Are you surprised? I mean, a part of me is not surprised with that. I'm not sitting there thinking I'm surprised with what some of these states are doing. California, I mean, you know, there's a reason why he lost a— two states lost a trillion dollars of money under management from 2020. New York and California, they got destroyed. And the first time they had net uh, negative migration— in California, since 1851, it hasn't happened. Then they got it back to back to back. So, and he just announced two days ago that he's raising gas taxes by 47 cents in the state of California. No wonder people are leaving. But I want to go to the tariffs conversation. Because he doesn't with you. want gas vehicles. He wants to use all electric vehicles. It's not going to work for him, though. It's and not going to work. People for him. They're going to get that. destroyed. No, I mean, he's already don't. lost Musk. How do you lose Tesla? How do you lose well, Musk asked, out of your state? I asked, I asked Elon. He takes this massive company and he left California. Mm-hmm. I just asked him this question yesterday. I said, when you left, because he's got a good thing in Texas. I said, when you left, did Newsom, Newsom, I call him Newsom because I think it's a more accurate name. But did Gavin Newsom call and say, can we talk? I want to take you out to dinner. I want you to keep your company. What did he say? He said he never called. Your biggest entrepreneur in your state leaves, you don't call. Number one, biggest guy. Number two, big company, very big company. But a big oil company left also. Taking thousands of jobs. Wow. But my question wasn't that, you know, that he left for whatever. I mean, did anybody ever call? He said, no. I said, did uh, Newscom call you at all? Did he, like, call and say, like, can we have dinner? I'd love you to stay here and we'll work out some tax benefits or something, you know, some mm-hmm, incentive mm-hmm. to stay. Uh, he said, never called. I was amazed at that. And, and you're talking about thousands of workers and wild. prestige. And having Elon is... That is, is wild that you lose and you don't make the phone you call. You know, Elon endorsed me very strongly a while ago. Mm-hmm. And there's no stronger endorsement. He said that if Trump doesn't get elected, this country is going down the tubes. It might not ever survive. He said it's the most important election. It was, I was honored. But I was I was amazed because I asked him two two days ago. I said... Did anybody make a play to keep you? Now think of it. You would, if you were governor, you heard a big company's leaving. I would. First phone call. At least you're calling. Say, right. Is there anything we can do to yeah. keep you, right? You know what I like about, uh, uh, and I do want to go to the tariffs, and I think this is a great transition. Tim Cook, they asked him, they said, why would you have a meeting with President Trump? Uh, because he's the only president that called me. Oh, okay, let's talk about something <laughs> else. So of course he's going to have a meeting with if the guy's called. Why wouldn't you call the CEO of your uh you know, $3 trillion company. But I let's just talk spoke to Tim Cook. So Tim, can I, I, think tell he, you? I think he's a, I think he's a quality CEO. Go for it. So if uh, I'm going to say, say something, just talk, people, when did you talk to him? Like how recent? Uh, two hours ago. Okay. He called me. I didn't okay. call him. And uh, let me give you just a little, the nice part about this long format, you can talk. Yes. Right. It's very nice. It's something very nice. As opposed to bing, 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 bing. That's why long format is working. Right? Yes. But I just talked to him. But I believe that if Tim Cook didn't run Apple, if Steve Jobs did, it wouldn't, maybe it would be, but it wouldn't be nearly as successful. Wow, as it's now. what a statement to I make. I think so. Because I think Tim what Cook has done, I think Tim Cook's done an amazing job. And I'm not knocking Steve Jobs. I just think that he, it wouldn't have been. So, I'll tell you a couple of stories. So, about uh, second term of second year, mm-hmm. I get a call, and they say Tim Cook's on the phone. He calls. He said, could I see you, sir? And he's the head of Apple. And I was born in Queens, and I said, oh, the head of Apple wants to see me. Let's go, I guess, even though I'm president, you know. Still, I was born in Queens, and the head of Apple's calling, and by that time, it was the largest company in the world. You know, it's the largest sure, yeah. in terms of value at that time. I don't know what it is now, but it was. So he comes in to see me, and it was about tariffs. He said, uh, you know, you're charging us. 25% because I was going to charge mm-hmm. them because we're out of China. And the problem is um, we can't compete with Samsung because they didn't have to pay tariffs because they weren't in China and they were in South Korea. And he said, it's uh, not really possible for me. And I did waivers, you know, standard waivers. It's not possible for me to compete with them if I have to pay a tax and they don't to get our product into the United States. I said, I agree with you. It didn't take long. I mean, I'm, you know, 
I got, I, I sort of got it, right? And I said, I'm going to give you a waiver, and I gave him a waiver. But I said, I'm going to give you a one-year waiver, but I want you to start building your plants in the United States. And he said, all right. And he actually did. He built one in Texas. He would have built a lot more, but we had a thing called, uh, you know, a, uh, a change in the administration, which is so horrible what happened because of uh, Russia would have never happened with Ukraine. Mm-hmm. October 7th would have never happened. Inflation would have never happened. Afghanistan, we would have gotten out sooner, actually, than him. But Afghanistan would have never happened, as we know it. All of these things would have never... Think of the difference in this company. No inflation. We would have been so rich because we would go in for the... We would have had four to five times the production that they have right now. You know, they lost the production and then they got it back because the whole thing was cratering mm-hmm. because oil went up to seven, eight dollars a gallon. So anyway, so Tim Cook called and I and then he about a year later he called again on something else. He said, Could I see you? Now most companies send in uh lobbyists that get paid millions and millions of dollars to talk for them. And they probably say, we know Trump, we can talk, but they don't, you know, for the most part, they don't. And Tim Cook called me up directly and he did it himself, didn't have to pay 10 cents. And I gave him a hundred percent of what he wanted because he was right. I mean, you can't compete with Samsung and one's paying a tax, but I said, you got to gradually move your, your company here. But then two hours ago, three hours ago, he called me. He said, I'd like to talk to you about something. What? He said, uh, the European union has just fined us $15 billion. I say, that's a lot. I know the feeling because I get fined too in fake cases. Mm -hmm. But I don't know if his case is is fake yet, but it's a lot. Then on top of that, they got fined by the European Union another $2 billion. So he's a $17 to $18 billion fine. I even said about Apple, can you pay that? I mean, do you have that guy? Mm -hmm. That's a lot of money. And he said something that was interesting. He said they're using that to run... Their enterprise, meaning Europe, is their enterprise. And I said, that's a lot. He said, but Tim, I got to get elected first. But I'm not going to let them take advantage of our companies. That won't, you know, be happening. Uh, I talked about yesterday, I talked about something that was very important. I don't know if it got, uh, China was building massive plants in Mexico. Hafusan. And massive I let them, plant, right. massive, the biggest right. plants in yep. the world. And my friend was actually building it. It's the one right there. Oh, that's it's it. It's massive. Guess what? They're not building it anymore. You know that, right? Right, I heard. But not, do you know, know why? why? Do, do, be- because of me. And if they built that, there would be no more Detroit. Mm-hmm. Now, Detroit's been decimated over the years, uh, but there <clears> would be no more Detroit. So they're building massive plants in Mexico. China's building mm-hmm. them. And they're going to make cars, sell them across the border, mm-hmm. and destroy every automobile manufacturer, even in South Carolina mm-hmm. and other places, Tennessee. They're going to destroy. You wouldn't have one automaking company. And what did I do? I said two months ago, that if they do that, I will put a 100 or 200 or 2,000 percent tariff on these cars, and they will never enter America. And that was it. And I said that four or five times during four or five speeches. And I met the man that's building the plants two days ago Mm -hmm. when I was in Detroit at the Economic Club of Detroit making a speech, talking about how uh, we're going to bring our car industry back, which is easy to do. All you have to do is the the proper incentives. And I mean, keeping Elon would have been easy to do, frankly, but nobody ever went to see. I I, want to push back on this. I'm curious to know what you say with this. So we thought about you. Everybody said, Pat, let's make sure we get one autograph hat of Future Looks Bright with the president's signature on it and allow people to compete for it. So here's what we're doing. Anybody that places an order of Future Looks Bright, $100, the first 100 of you, one of you will be the lucky winner of this signed hat by Donald J. Trump. So go to vtmerch.com, minimum order $100. One of you will send this hat to you. So go back to this. So when I think about, by the way, Tim Cook, he Steve Jobs dies, Apple's worth $100 billion, today's worth Three trillion, he thirty x. So, kind of credibility on what he did. He's no, a I just very don't good think operator. Steve Jobs would have been as good. It's as, interesting as he... point you're making. It's a good point to debate. But I want to go to the uh, uh, China, uh, Mexico. So, for the first time in a long time, actual labor is cheaper in Mexico than it is in China. Mexico is now three ninety an hour all in. China's four fifty, right? And when I think about this phone that Tim Cook, Steve Jobs, they built. This phone, if I buy it made in China, 
costs eleven hundred dollars. Okay, if I buy it, they try to do a quarter in India, backfired. They don't have the infrastructure right, right. yet, so he kind of right. wanted to find out what to do next. If I buy this in U.S. and it's made in U.S., it's twenty four hundred dollars, right? So there's a part of it with Nixon where I think Nixon got it right. And years ago, you and Nixon had a relationship. He even said, whenever you run, you're going to be a president. He said this many, many years ago. He did say it. Nixon His wife was said for... It. His wife said it. When, when Pat, you're right, saying... She right. said, I watched somebody in the Phil Donahue show. She said, I watched a man on television, a young man on television. I, I have the letter. It's the most beautiful letter. He said, my wife just told me you'll be president, because I knew him a little bit. And uh, I said, mm, that's interesting. I have to think about that. But it was very nice, actually. But no, she said it. But go ahead, please. So, so that's when, when you think about it, the first time we sold a Toyota in the States was 58. In 72, under Nixon, Toyota sold a million cars here. And, and that kind of forced Americans to be like, hey, you know, we got to find a way to lower the price point. So we need a little bit of competition when it comes down to the tariff side, right? We do too much. Price may go up because if we do make this in America and cash flow income is not going up, middle Americans may be like, I can't afford to do this. Yes, we'd love to have it made in America, but you know, a regular person making fifty-five thousand dollars, you can't afford this. So, how do you balance and manage tariffs so the average person so is not affected by? It? Please, but before I do that, yeah. so let me just say, already tariffs, because I to me, I think it's the most beautiful word in the dictionary. More beautiful yeah. than love. More beautiful than any word I know, tariff. It will make our country extremely wealthy again, because right now we're poor, we're broke. It'll make our country wealthy again. And uh, it's the most powerful word there is. Okay, so just by the mere mention of the fact that I am going to put 100 to 200% tariffs on every car coming out of that factory mm -hmm. that you just put, that car plant mm -hmm. that's being built, actually started and stopped. The fact that I mentioned it, I said to the man the other day, because I told him, you know, this started, I want to see a great car plant. He's the best in the world at building them, the biggest. And he said, I'll have to take you to Mexico. I said, you got to be kidding. I want to see in the United States. He said, we don't build them in the United States. We build them in Mexico and China and all over, but mm -hmm. not. That's because we're stupid, okay? We have, and yet we sell them. They, they, all that product would be sold in the United States. So... I said, are you building it now? Yes, we're just starting. This was a year ago, let's say. And it's the biggest in the world. I think he said two of them, actually, but the biggest in the world. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I hadn't seen him. He's a great guy. All he does is plants. If you said build an apartment, he wouldn't know how to build it. I mean, all he does, he does, you know, tremendous new big plants. I saw him the other day when I made a speech at the Detroit uh, really economic summit. It, it was great, on cars. And I see him in the audience, and I see him afterwards, and I say, could I ask you, how is the big plants coming? Oh, they stopped construction. I said, really? They did why? Tell me why. Because they think you're going to be elected, and if you get elected, you're going to put 100% tariff or 200. You even said 200. They said, if Trump gets elected, we're not going to spend billions of dollars building plants in Mexico. I saved Detroit, what's left of it, don't forget, Detroit can make a great renaissance with me, with her. She doesn't even know what you and I are talking about stuff mm -hmm. right now. She would have no idea what we're talking about. You get it really good. You get it better than almost anybody. Even when I spoke at Bloomberg the other day, he wasn't a tariff guy. I said, well, you got to be a tariff guy because if tariff don't work, you our, need to use our it. country's broke. 100% you need to use but it. But just think of it. The, the fact that I said I'm going to put tariffs right. on all of those cars that are coming out of that plant, that's a big plant. That's maybe one of the biggest in the world, right? Now, those cars were going to come all into the United States. If they come into the United States, that means there's not going to be any room. That, that, that makes more mm -hmm. than Detroit makes, mm -hmm. okay, than everybody. So that would mean that our car industry is wiped out. I hope that the union workers, the auto workers, mm -hmm. understand that I saved their jobs. Because in a year and a half, when that thing opened, you wouldn't have one car being made in the Midwest or any place else in this country. So because of Donald Trump, and he said that, he said, because of you, construction has totally stopped. They're absolutely, they gave up in the job. Now, if I didn't get elected, 
They'll They're be gonna building start it. They're going to build it. They you, will. You watch. The only thing for Hopefully me is that won't the only thing for me is that I would be curious to know how the administration is going to take it. Is has to you have to impose tariffs on a country that's bullying. For example, I love what you did with Iran when you put the sanctions. I'm yeah. in Monaco, June 26th of 2019. It's my 10 year anniversary. We're there with my wife. We're laying by uh, Carlton Hotel. I think it's in Cairns, and having the you know award winning lobster roll, whatever they claim there, and. Uh, I meet this guy, Middle Eastern guy. He comes and he says, hey, Patrick, how are you? We start talking. I said, what do you do? He says, well, I'm a pretty powerful guy. I said, really? Yeah. He says, here, Google me. So I go on. I'm like, oh, interesting. I said, I'm curious. So you manage what? He says, 21 countries in the Middle East. I'm the one that says who gets to do business banking with Iran and none. I said, what did Trump sanctions on Iran do? He says, let's go in the middle of the ocean and talk. And you have to set your phone aside. I'll never forget this. So we go in the middle of the ocean. Standing out there having a conversation, wives are talking, we're over there. He says, everybody, if you can pull up, that, that's the one, is that what it is? Here's the economic growth in Iran. If you look at that, hey. 15, 16 nuclear deal implemented, sanctions lifted, then it's you, 18, 19, they're being decimated. I mean, these guys are getting destroyed. They right? wanted to make a deal. They wanted to make a deal. Then they had to come make a deal. in. And then you, you know, Biden comes and obviously things change right afterwards. So for this time around with Iran, with everything that's going on with sanctions, there is a method to the madness. What Remember back chart. in the days you can, put can that you thing on Can you send me that chart? Look at that. This? They wanted to make a deal. I'm not looking to hurt Iran. They wanted to make a deal. Because I told China, if you buy one barrel of oil, one, you're not ever doing business in the United States again. They said, we'll pass to Iran. They passed. Nobody was buying from Are you going to bring this back, the strategy back with Iran? Different with Iran. strategies. It all depends. Very fertile mind, different strategies. But but they're very close to having a nuclear weapon. You have to understand, I didn't want much. All I wanted is you can never have a nuclear mm. weapon. I didn't want much. I wanted Iran to be very successful. I just don't want them to have a nuclear weapon. Right. Because that's the real threat. The real threat isn't global warming. The real threat is, threat is nuclear warming. Okay. That's the real warming because, you know, I'm the one that rebuilt our military, rebuilt the whole military. And part of what I rebuilt is the nuclear. And I hated to do it, but we had to because China has it, Russia has it, you know, et cetera. Uh, But I know more about nuclear than anybody because, um, and I can just only tell you this, the power is obliteration, okay? It's not... I always say it's not two army tanks running around. What's going to happen to Iran with you by the by the end of your administration? Um, I, I don't. Would, I'm not asking. I would tactics. like to see I'm Iran just... be very successful. The only thing is they can't have a nuclear weapon. They Are just... you okay with the same administration and way of governing stays, or would you like to see it go back to the '70s when Shah's was running it and um, Iran was one of the top three countries look, in we, tourism? Yeah, we can't get totally involved in all. You know, I mean, okay. we're suppo- right. we can't run ourselves. Let's face it, sure, Patrick. We can't run ourselves. You put sanctions, that's going to, they, they don't have, the people are going to turn and flip on them. It's not going to be a, a, what should, I think if you would have When I handed re-elected. it over, I told them, right now, make a deal with Iran, they'll do anything. They wanted to make a deal with me. They wanted, had that election not been rigged and stolen, I will tell you right now, we would have no problems anywhere in the world. You know, um, Viktor Orban, you know, he's a very mm-hmm. tough guy and a very mm-hmm. smart guy. And mm-hmm. he's, uh, you know, some of the European countries don't like him because he's, you know, sure, smart. Sure, makes sense. And uh, they, they do things that aren't so smart. But he said, uh, they said, what's happening? The whole world is blowing up now. The Middle East, mm-hmm. and Russia, Ukraine. I mean, now all of a sudden, you know, I mean, it's getting really bad over there. I'll tell you, the Russia, Ukraine, getting really bad. You could have World War Three, and we have two people, her and him. And she's not as smart as Biden. Biden, believe it or not... And this is a very small group of people fit into this category. He's smarter than she is, okay? You have a problem. And even the three or four months left, Mm -hmm. that's a lot of months. That's Mm -hmm. a lot of time Mm -hmm. left. You could have World War III Mm -hmm. before I would take office, even if I would. So let me ask you this. This country is in, the world is in grave danger. But you know what Victor Orban said? He said, if Trump comes back in, Everything solved. He said when he ran it, we had no wars, we had no problems. Now, he used the term they were afraid of Trump. I don't want to use that term because it's like, you know, 
But they were. They were afraid of me. They didn't know what the hell I was going to do. And that included Russia. Don't forget, they always said, oh, I'm so close to Putin. I had a good relationship with Putin. I had a good relationship with President Xi. But what did I do to Putin? I ended the pipeline going to Germany and all over Europe. The biggest job they've ever had is the pipeline going all over, the, all over Europe. I terminated it. Think of it. Do you think that's a good relationship? No. Putin said, you know, I'd hate to see you if you were angry at us. Mm-hmm. You understand. But what did I do? First, earlier, earlier, and then you go, well, Trump was in the pocket of Russia. Trump was in the pocket. I ended the biggest job they've ever done, a job that made more money. Biden comes in, and what does he do? He approves it. He lets it go forward. It was dead. It was never going to happen. He let, And what else did he do? He took the Keystone Pipeline, which was our pipeline, which should have been approved, and he terminated it just before construction was started. They've lost credibility at this point. But with Iran, so here's one thing. If, the reason why I'm asking this, I lived in Iran almost 11 years, and I was, you know, I'm a— Are I, you Iranian? Of I was born Armenian, mother's side, Assyrian, father's side. You gave a shout-out to Assyrians the other I day did. in Arizona. It was great seeing Assyrians for Trump. But uh, I'm asking— You know this. why they were there? They were so nice. I met this. They said, the Assyrians— they said, could you give us a shout out? I said, who are you? <laughs> I didn't know. They said, we're a serious. I said, what does that mean? But they were really nice people. And I said, I think yeah. I mispronounced it a yeah. little. But I said. You did. You got to write this down. But going back to Iran. So uh, uh, last topic on this. I just want to uh, clear this up. So Ghassan Soleimani, you take him out. That's their hero. That's their general Patton. When you take him out, they want to seek vengeance. So now. Hey, they're, they're targeting you. They're coming after you. Assassination attempts, all this stuff. They create these videos that they're going to come. We haven't forgotten that you took our hero out. Great. So Carter Reagan, when Reagan got elected, remember they released, was it 59 prisoners, uh, you know, who had yeah. been held hostage for 444 days. If I'm getting the numbers right, can you see 59, 444 days? What's the number? 52 I'm, Americans, 444 44 days. days. Boom. The minute... Inauguration, they released them, Khomeini, right? And it's like, oh, this guy's in, he's going to do something about it. This is my question for you. Say you win November 5th. Say it's a landslide. Say it's done, okay? From November 5th to you're yeah. going back to putting your yeah. hand in inauguration on the stage. During that time, that season, what do you think is going to happen during that season? Is during that season Russia, Ukraine going to be done? During that season, you think it's going to be that quickly? Or do you think, think it's going to be after? I think the world's going to behave, and I think I will settle Russia, Ukraine while I'm president-elect. At, while you're president-elect? While I'm president-elect. Wow. You need that credibility. Sure. While I'm president-elect, I will settle it. You know, I met with Zelensky the other day. Uh, I have good relationship with Putin and with Zelensky. You didn't look too happy standing next to you, though. Well, look, this is a war that should have never happened. You have millions of people that are dead, much more than you're reading about. You know, when you see these, I was amazed at how big, I'm in the real estate business, to put it mildly. Sure. So I know buildings. Those buildings were massive. You know, they were long rather than tall. They were 12 to 15 stories, but they went, like for blocks, they were massive buildings. Rockets were hitting the buildings, they were collapsing. A lot of people were killed. You hear two people were injured. No, no, many people were killed. That war is much more deadly than they're telling you. It has to be settled. But here's the problem. It should have never happened. If I were president, that war would have never happened. Putin would have never done it. The war would have never happened. You're saying, without even a settlement. Without even a settlement. But well, you're saying after November 5th, pre as a president elect, you're saying things are going to get done during that time? I'd like to be able How to How about do Iran it? and Israel? What, what about uh, that one? Uh, well, that depends. A lot's happening right now. I know We're going to have to see what right. happens. Okay. That one is a very interesting one. And <sighs> it's become more interesting because Israel didn't listen to Biden and, and her and did what they wanted to do. And they put themselves in a pretty strong position. I mean, let's face it. Who would have thought this was going to happen? Uh, everybody was very afraid of Iran. They're less afraid of Iran now. What they did to Hezbollah and Hamas, if you take a look oh, at what's going on. law, they, they took everybody out. I mean, the, no, the I pagers mean, no, there. No, the whole thing with the pagers. Right. It was from the pagers. That, because 
those were your leaders. I mean, those were the leaders. It was That's like right. 2,000 Straight to the top. And people. the guy that replaced him, they out. took him out as well. I mean, uh, that was that. Because so nobody wants like that job. And the, I was like, hey, would you like this job? <laughs> I'll pass. I don't want the, the job. Right. right. So it's a different, you know, it's a different story. But only because BB did not listen to Biden. Biden wanted everything to just sort of right. foment. Um, they wouldn't listen to him. Do you think BB will listen tells to you? you? Do I what? Do you think BB will listen to you? Uh, yeah. Oh, he'll listen to me 100%. 100%. 100%. Don't forget, I got them more than, and not because this isn't the reason, but I got them Golan Heights. Mm -hmm. They've been trying to get it for as long as they were around. I got them Golan Heights. They wanted, they pe planes would fly in every year to try and figure it out. I got them Golan Heights. <laughs> But more importantly than that, I ended the Iran nuclear deal, which was BB fought like hell to have it. Remember that? Mm -hmm. Fought like mm -hmm. hell. Came in to see Obama. Fought. And I also got them very important. I, I helped them with their military, everything else. But I got them Jerusalem, capital. I got them Jerusalem. Not only did I get it for them, I built the embassy. I didn't just say that. I got it built. And I built it for peanuts too. I didn't spend two billion dollars. <throat> I built it for. I love what you said the other day when you were doing the uh, uh, the new Air Force One from five point three billion to three point yeah. seven billion. Hey, who would have paid? They would have paid for that. It's it, it's great to have no, a negotiator. Said, does that mean I, you made right, one point seven, 7 billion, billion like, which is insane? That was a, you're sitting there and it's like, yeah, Obama. They just cut the check, and I'm like, what are you talking about? An yeah. operator would never do that. I have a few minutes, and I, I want to hit a few questions okay. with you. So, you get in when you work for a new company. You get a job. You go to HR. And then when you work for the company, that's a big company. Let's just say they got 100,000 employees. Let's say you're working for an IBM. Let's say you're working for Boeing. Hundreds of thousands of employees. You're going to kind of find out who the manipulators are. You're going to find out who the power players are. You're going to find out who the EF Hutton is. You're going to find out who the guy that get the job done, the guy that even though you replace him, he left. People are still talking to the guy because maybe they want you to fail. So they're still, you know, all this stuff that happens, right? 100%. When you went in, day one, you're a president. How did you decipher between knowing who were really the power players, who were the manipulators, who were the ones that would threaten them behind closed doors? How did you go through that process when you first got in? So my problem was I was never, I mean, I was in Washington. They say, the, the fake news said this, So, but let's assume it's true for a change. 17 times. I was there 17 times. I never stayed over. So I was not a Washington person. I didn't know people in Washington. When you became president? You when I became, yeah. When I became president. Right. In other words... I ran for president. I was only in Washington 17 times. And most of it was I was building a hotel, a beautiful hotel that I sold. It's now the Waldorf Astoria. And I built it. I did a great job, sold it, made some money. And it was, it was great. But that was most of the time. I was only there. Think of it. Beautiful. I was only there. That's it, right? Yeah. Uh, that's a beautiful job in a great location that, oh, maybe I shouldn't have sold it. <laughs> <laughs> you are funny. No, I'm looking at it. I'm saying, ah, <laughs> That is that. a beautiful property. No, I did a great job with it. My whole family did, uh, Ivanka and Don and everybody and Eric. Eric did a fantastic job. But anyway, I built that. But 17 so I days? Was, I didn't know 17 that. 17 days total. Never stayed over. Okay, but that's what they say, but it's about right. In other words, I wasn't a Washington person. So all of a sudden, I'm president. I land on Air Force One. You never saw so many motorcycles and cars and everything. Mm -hmm. Military mm -hmm. marching. Everybody's marching. I'm saying, I said to my wife, oh, and we're going down Pennsylvania Avenue. And we're in the back of the beast, you know, the world's mm -hmm. longest army tank, right? And we're in the back of the beast. And I look to the left, and there's the building. And we're going the opposite direction of the roads. You know, the roads are closed. On that day, you could have gone if you're any, any way you want. So we're going, and I say, look, there's the hotel, and there's the White House. A couple of blocks further is the White House. Here's the, I say, did you ever see anything so incredible? This is surreal. I have the brand new hotel, and I have the White House, and I'm president. But here's the bad part. I didn't know anybody in Washington other than some politicians. And I knew them because I was a contributor, not because I was a politician. Because I had only done this a few months, you know. I ran. And that, but, but, but you're in the business of uh, reading bullshit. You, you're I in am. the business of no, reading, I am. like, manipulators. Yeah, but there's a, there's a lot of people. So what happens is I had to rely on people for advice. And 
largely I got it right. You know, don't forget, you only hear about, like, stupid people like a Bolton or I don't want to mention even Barr because he endorsed me the other day. You saw that. Endorsed <laughs> me strongly. I was impressed by that. But I put people in there who I I made mistakes. But I made, I got it mostly right. Great trade people. I had great trade. That's not the question I'm asking, if I may. Here's what I'm asking. What I'm asking, I'm not even asking about, hey, why would you hire these guys to swamp? Yeah. And that question's already been addressed. I'm not interested in that question. The question I'm asking is, you're in. You're in a new space. Who were really the powerful people? Was it the director of CIA? Was it FBI? Was it the big pharma? Was it military industrial complex guys that are general yeah. dynamics? Yeah. Who were the people that are like, it. oh, I got you. You have, I, I never it. thought you had power. Who actually has the power? The most powerful person by far, the president. Power over everybody. Power. The power is enormous. Most people don't believe that. It's, it, it is. But there is a sort of a deep state. And a lot of that's people that have been there. And then there's some bad guys. There's some bad people. Then there's a radical left, which I think are more dangerous in many ways than mm -hmm. the other countries. Mm -hmm. I really do. You know, uh, guys like Shifty Adam Schiff and other people. They're bad people. They're sort of sick people. Not stupid people either, by the way. Smart people. Of course. People. Sure. But they're vicious. But they're very bad for our but country. Is Adam Schiff powerful? Can you imagine? Well, he made up the Russia hoax. No, he but what and I'm Hillary. Saying, no, what I'm saying is who is their boss? Who, th who calls them and say, you better or I, else? I think it's an amorphous group. It's, it's a group. It's not one person. It's an amorphous group of lunatics. And when they come together, they're, they're pretty bad. But uh, l let me just say this. The president has the absolute, if the president, is, now Biden doesn't know he's alive. So I don't think he, I really believe they used him as a uh, vessel, like a vessel in the night. And uh, I, I really believe that. Um, she's a little bit more dangerous because she's basically a Marxist like her father. Her father's a Marxist. You know what I don't understand? Mm. Why has the father not been interviewed? I mean, nobody talks about that. If that were a Republican situation, the father would be all over the place. Where's the father? I haven't had one. I've, I haven't seen one article where they're looking for the father. So the father is a Marxist professor of economics, which is an interesting thing. Marxist and economics you, you, don't go together. Right? You know what's the one thing? Uh, my, everybody says, what's your favorite uh, four years of Trump or four years of Obama? All these guys that you look at moments, right? My right. favorite moment of you being a president is this moment here. This is what I love the most. It was a first time where a president is running a vlog style administration where, Rob, if you can play this clip, this is you're talking about building the wall, shutting down the government, and you put the camera on their face. I think you did this once also yeah. with Kissinger, which I don't know if that was a power play int intentional or not. I thought it was. Play this clip, Rob. None of us have you said You want to know something? You've said okay, it. Okay, you want to put that you on You said mind. it. I'll take it. Okay, okay, good. You know what I'll say? Yes. If we don't get what we want, one way or the other, whether it's through you, through a military, through anything you want to call, I will shut down the government. Okay, Absolutely. fair enough. And we I am disagree. proud, and I'll we tell you disagree. what, I am proud to shut down the government for border security, Chuck, because the people of this country don't want criminals and people that have lots of problems and drugs pouring into our country. So I will take the mantle. You can I will be the one. You know what did this to and By me, the way, I how right was I? And now... And I had the strongest border we ever had, and I used soldiers from Mexico and every other thing you got to for nothing, zero cost. I had the strongest border. But look at that guy. Look, they're all threats to our nation. He and his group, after I was gone, opened up the border, and our country has been poisoned, okay? Poisoned. We have yeah. killers, we have murderers, we have the drug lords, we have... We have everything. We have terrorists at numbers. Do you know in 2019, uh, a report was done that not one terrorist was allowed in. Now, I think it's probably wrong because it's, you know, I want to take credit for it. It was my year. Have you seen the terrorist then, stat? Uh, thousands, thousands. Rob, pull up the clip with not this one, the other one, Rob, because you like good charts. I think you're going to love this chart. So this is the chart. I don't know if you've seen this or not. So this is the no. terrorist attacks, deaths, and injuries based on different presidents being there. If you go to 2008 to 2016, that's the Barack Obama era. Look what he did. He produced more terrorist attacks during his era. 16, you get elected. Look what happens. Yep. Disappearance. I had right? nothing. So, 
I had none. I I understand. So, to, but the reason why I show this clip is if you're, I like admit, I like these charts. I must have. Yeah. I like the my chart the best. You know my <laughs> yeah, that's the chart. Know, I have a chart that I like better than any chart I've ever yeah. seen. Better than any person. I'm, I'm I've glad ever you seen. were looking at the chart. I think a lot of people are happy yeah. you were looking at the no, chart. No, no, I love these charts right. that you have. No, I'm talking about the chart you looked at when you got shot. Oh, yeah. and well, you were if I didn't have that chart, direction. I would be not a different be here. Story. We would not be having this. Let's talk this a little bit of family. Chat. Let's talk a little bit of family yeah. with the last few minutes that we have. So, um, Baron Trump, I, I spent some time with Baron. He invited me. I came to Mar a Lago, right. sat down. I watched I, your son I saw you. for an hour and a half, two hours, how he was. I think his, is he March 20th? His birthday's yeah. in March. I remember it's March. He had just turned 18. And I'm watching how he's talking to. Kobe, all these other guys sitting at the table. And I'm like, very interesting. And I know your uh, uh, Melania, I think, called him Little Donald. I think if I'm not mistaken, she gave that nickname to him. He's not and, so little because he's a pretty he's, tall guy. He, but you used the word. You said something when he you were being interviewed like five years ago. You said, he's strong, he's vicious, he's tough. Like you kind of are like, he's got, you know, he's got that uh, part about him. What what can you tell us about Baron from your point of view? Well, he's very he's very um, he's very smart. He's a good student and all that. He goes to a great school and does really well. And he's a very nice guy. You see that mm -hmm. he's a very uh, uh, he's he's uh, he doesn't mind being alone, but he's somebody that gets along with people. He loved having you that night. I saw you. I was at a different table. I said, "Look at Baron. He's really having a good time." But you, uh, you're like a psychiatrist for a lot of people. I mean, this interview is now <laughs> twice as long as it's supposed to be. And we talked about some really amazing things. We talked about Baron, of course. Mm -hmm. I got to say, he is such a, he said, Dad, you got to do me one favor. What? You have to say hello to Patrick for me. I mean, it's cute, you know. He's 18 years old, but he's like he's not amazing. an average 18 year old. Though. No, the no, he's very smart. He's very. Is he is he good with the ladies in school? Well, he, I don't think, I'm is not he, sure. Is he there yet? Or? I'm not sure he's there yet. No, I'm not okay. sure he's. Well. Uh, he's. Uh, I don't think he's had a girlfriend yet. I don't think. I really? Don't, yeah, I don't think so. I don't, he's, every once in a while, he's a good looking guy. He's a good looking. He's a good looking guy. Yeah, he's. He's got the swagger. He's a good troller. He's funny. He's yeah, witty. He's yeah. a, Last question for you. And me. I have good kids. I mean, my kids are good. Well, I mean, that's the one thing that uh, your old best friend, Hillary Clinton, gave you credit uh, of, uh, uh, if you remember that one time, which she said, what's the credit? You said, she's not a, you know, she doesn't give up. And she said, you've raised great kids. Last question for you. I'm curious to know what you say about this. So um, I'm in Northridge, California. It's probably 18 years ago. I'm at a restaurant called Claim Jumpers. And I'm meeting this pastor, Pastor Dudley Rutherford, great guy. And I'm like, hey, you know, relationship with father and son, okay? What would you say about a relationship with father and son? What tips could you give me? And he says, you know, a, a son and a father go through three phases. Phase number one, you idolize them. Okay. Phase two, you demonize them. Phase three, you humanize them, okay? Very interesting. And I'm like, very interesting, like that you go through that or you go from you know, idolize, oh my God, I want to be like my dad when I grow up. You know what? You don't ever believe in me. What can I do to make you proud? Like, man, I didn't know what he was going through, that kind of stuff. I should have never said this and that. I'm totally messed up, right? For you, there is one of the talks you're given, which, you know, I understand, you know, earlier mentor mine told me, never show hurt, never show pain, always be in the offensive, killer instinct, attack, you know, something. So it's like, yeah, you know, I'm a competitor. I'm a fierce guy. I'm going to get into business and insurance. They didn't like me because I was building an agency, 60,000 insurance agents nationwide. We sold it. I got a fat check, 88% owner. You know, I realized there's a part of you got to stay tough. But then there's some parts you're like, wait a minute. I can't be tough with everybody, right? You know, you're in, I want to say, is this Glendale, Rob? I don't know where it's at. This is last year, September. If you can play this clip, Rob, this is the first time where I watched you and I said, wow, okay, this is South Dakota. So this is Rapid City, uh, South Dakota. You're speaking, and all of a sudden you have this moment. If you can play this clip, I want to get a reaction to this. Go for it, Rob. And help build America into the greatest nation in the history of the world.
45 seconds you're holding yourself back? Well, let me explain. So I think I'm the only politician that ever spoke to music before. And I do that sometimes at the end of some of the rallies. That was a big rally. We had a lot of people. We have a lot of people at all the rallies. Had 100,000 people in Butler, more than 100 the other day, mm -hmm. a couple of weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And we had in California just this last week, uh, we had 107,000 people. So we got big crowds. And sometimes I do my final remarks with music. Now, uh, I, I always get... Uh, I don't know if emotional or angry. I, more angry than emotional because I don't, you know. And I'm not sure I want to admit emotional, but uh, no, I I tend to wait when when the music goes on. I tend to wait, maybe thirty seconds, maybe twenty seconds. So I mean, I don't want to spoil your thing, but I want to be honest. No, it wasn't emotion. It is sort of anger. If which is, of course, an emotion. Mm -hmm. But my closings for the uh, rallies, sometimes I play that music and I talk about how bad we're doing, how badly we're doing terribly as a country. We're a third world nation. Look, we are a nation in decline. I mean, we are in serious decline. And now on top of it, they're allowing all these people to come in mm -hmm. and it's not sustainable, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And I go into that during this. It's a different rally. It's a different rally speech. Um, I used to go right from my regular speech and then the music would come on and I didn't like it. Now I, the music comes on and I wait 20 or 30. So I don't want to ruin your thing, but that's no, but actually you know what I'm asking. You know, I'd like to you say, know why I'm asking a question? I would like to say I was crying can, can like I, I said, but I, I didn't. Here's why I'm asking a question. I'm asking a question because I think your life with Americans has been that. Yeah. I think you were idolized for decades, decades. Then you were demonized. And I don't know, when I watch, you know, uh, uh, Nixon at his wife's funeral, you see him, you know, like, yeah, this right. guy's got First feelings, Pat, yeah. When you yeah. see Reagan, so when you see Putin, when it's one of his friends, when you see some of the most, Michael Jordan was a killer instinct when his father, when I, when I, when I think about, we don't have to play this, when I think about you, uh, a, a lot of the folks I talked, I'm like, man, this, is this guy... Does this guy have feelings? Is he like that cold all the time? Is he that competitive that it's always never show hurt, never show emotion? Is it like that even at this phase? Like, can I get an ounce of feeling from the guy that I can sit there and say, man, I want to humanize this guy. This guy's like me. Why am I expecting this guy to walk on water? I don't know. You know, I, I think I think there's an opportunity for the American people to go through that with you I know. Uh, to experience that. And by the way, if you say. And, and there's nothing wrong with it. Right. I, I don't personally think that the American people want to see, especially at this point, our country is doing badly. I don't th personally think they want to see a president that cries. I no, mean, I'm not saying yeah. cry. I'm not at all talking about crying. This is not at all about crying. This isn't one of those moments like, hey, let's, no, the goal I is know. to get him cry. It's not that. It's to see a side where somebody says, ah, you know what? I'm, I'm going to vote for this guy. Yeah. I'm going to support this guy. Yeah. No, I understand it. And certainly... Uh, there could be that time. Look, I'm very sad by what's happened to this country. We're not respected anymore. We're not, we will be respected very soon. It won't take that long. Mm -hmm. uh, but we have to fix our country. Our country's broken. Uh, this has been the worst president and vice president in history, and now she's, you know, running for president. And if for some reason she won, and I believe the only reason they can win, I, I really believe that. I, I don't think people would vote for her. I just don't believe it can happen. But I think, you know, Elon Musk says it better than anybody. He says our country's uh, finished, essentially. Mm -hmm. He said it would be finished. Very smart guy. Uh, a lot of people say that. A lot of people say this will be our last election. You know, you've heard that, too. I, I Listen, for for, for It's some so the bad what they're doing to our country on the borders. It's so bad what they're doing with the money. The billions and billions of dollars. I think Zelensky is one of the greatest salesmen I've ever seen. Every time he comes in, we give him $100 billion. Who else got that kind of money in history? There's never been. Mm. And that doesn't mean I don't want to help him because I feel very badly for those people. But he should never have let that war start. 
That war is a loser. Ukraine, remember, is not Ukraine anymore. Every city almost is knocked down to the ground. Mm -hmm. All those beautiful golden domes are laying on their side, smashed to smithereens. There's no city. You go into the city and every building is demolished. It looks like a demolition crew went through. They've been hit by missiles. This should have been settled before it started. It could have. It would have been so easy. If we had a president with half a brain, it would have been easy to settle. And I'm not, you know, everyone would say, oh, this is terrible. He's blaming Biden. Well, I do largely blame Biden. If you watch his words, his words were the exact opposite of what he should have been saying. Mm -hmm. He instigated that war. And he got Putin... There's no angel and Putin's no angel. But everything Biden said was wrong. That should have never happened. I'm telling you, Patrick, that war, if I were president, zero, even Democrats admit it. And you know what? It didn't happen for four years. And it was never going to happen. And yet, I will tell you, I spoke to Putin often about it. I said, don't ever do it. But Ukraine was the apple of his eye. And when he saw how incompetently the uh, our country, our country, our our president, our stupid generals like Milley, who's a stupid person, when he saw how incompetent we were in Afghanistan, the most embarrassing moment in the history of our country, I believe, when he looked at that, he said, "Trump is gone. These people are idiots. I'm going to go into take the mm-hmm. apple of my mm-hmm. eye." Would have never happened if I was there. And this has been very interesting being with you. Likewise. My son's Likewise. right about you. Very, very good. I've really enjoyed it, Mr. President. Thank you for making the time to be here with us. Thank you very much. Brother. Yes. It's a great Anytime. honor. We'll do it again. Likewise. Looking forward to it. Good. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. So we thought about you. Everybody said, Pat, let's make sure we get one autograph hat of Future Looks Bright with the president's signature on it and allow people to compete for it. So here's what we're doing. Anybody that places an order of Future Looks Bright, $100, the first 100 of you, one of you will be the lucky winner of this signed hat by Donald J. Trump. So go to vtmerch.com, minimum order $100. One of you will send this hat to you.